online with one hour, 49 minutes of runtime. Test Bay UPS is online with a minimum of 30 minutes of runtime. Data Center UPS is online with one with 48 minutes of runtime. T minus seven minutes. T minus six minutes. Central support systems operator, turn on the water boost pumps. The water boost pumps are on. Roger. T minus five minutes. I'm Alyssa Lee, and you're joining us live here at the Northrop Grumman facility in Promontory, Utah. Teams at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida systems. are preparing for the first Artemis launch, and we're here in Utah as teams evaluate materials and processes for future booster designs. We are moments away from a All hot fire test of a space streaming. launch system booster motor for those future Artemis missions to the moon. Today's test is called Flight Support Booster 2. We did see a delay of this test today, but we are here and we are ready to fire up this booster. The booster motors for NASA Space Launch System are the largest, most powerful ever built for flight. SLS has two solid rocket boosters that flank either side of the rocket. And for two minutes today, we're gonna see the power of just one of those here in the Utah desert. If you're just now joining us, we're about five minutes away from the Flight Support Booster 2 test in Utah. The booster motor used for today's test is locked to the test stand just behind me. Be sure to follow us on social media at NASA this Space Launch System on Facebook and NASA status. SLS on Twitter. Support but no matter where you're watching, you can ask us your questions by using the hashtag AskNASA. High speed systems are go. We're going to have some booster experts EDC join me here go. after the test to answer motor those questions. Are go. And now I'd like to introduce you to a special guest with me today. Test. This is Reed Wiseman, NASA astronaut engineer, aviator, and chief of the astronaut office. It's an honor to have you here today, Reed. Thank you for joining us. You bet, it's great to be here. Yeah, so we did see a delay today. Can you explain more about what that was about? So what we were told is they were having trouble communicating with a few of the cameras that are up at the test facility there by the booster, but they're gonna proceed without that data because it was not critical for the test. So we're back under the count and about three minutes away from lighting this thing. 
Yeah, and we're excited to see it. I mean, it's going to be a great experience. I, I believe this is your first. Is this your first test? test? It is. It All right, is so mine. both of us. This <laughs> yeah. is our first test. Yes, this is the first time I've been at one of these booster tests, and uh, I just think it's absolutely awesome that we'll be launching Artemis One in just a few weeks on two of these boosters. So it's really neat to get to be here today. Yeah, we're excited for launch. Now, can you tell me more about why testing like this is so important? Uh, because when we put humans on these things, we want to make sure they work. So uh -huh. uh, they're testing a few critical systems on this booster today. That's not related. At at all to Artemis 1, but is related to our future crewed Artemis flights. Yeah, I think um, Artemis 3 and beyond is uh, what we're testing for today. And so can you kind of tell me more about what we're expecting to see with this booster test? Uh, about two minutes of a lot of heat and fire coming out the back of that motor. <laughs> and uh, I know about four seconds after it lights off, we should feel the pressure wave and hear the sound, mm -hmm. uh, much like we were watching uh, a shuttle or an SLS launch at the Cape. I think mm -hmm. it's be pretty awesome. I mean, the wind is coming down the hill kind of right at us, so it should be carrying the sound down this valley. You can see like literally thousand plus uh, employees uh, from Northrop Grumman out here to watch and NASA. So uh, I think it's going to be amazing. Yeah, and I think um, the cameras might even shake a little bit from this test. I mean, you got to think about we're only getting a little taste of what we could see at launch. You know, this is only a single booster. And at launch, we're going to have two of those. So it's going to be a great sight to see. Two, and, and then the four RS-25s on oh, the yeah. bottom of the core stage going off, uh, you know, about six seconds before the boosters light off. So uh -huh. that's it's just going to be absolutely amazing to watch uh, what American ingenuity, what the American workforce can put together uh, when we launch Artemis 1 here in a couple weeks. I can't wait to be there to watch it. I absolutely agree. Well, thank you, Reed, for that great insight. <laughs> now, remember, we're going to have some booster experts join me here after the test to answer your questions. Use that hashtag AskNASA on social media to send those to us. Now, let's get ready to fire up this booster. You're going to hear a countdown from the test conductor, followed by a two-minute booster firing. We're going to cut away, and we'll be back here after the test. Commit the motor. T minus 60 seconds. All high speed systems are recording. T minus 50 seconds. TVC is go for static test. T minus 40 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, fire. One, fire. Activate to work with 
Activate head in CO2. Activated. Activate quench tool forward command. Activates aft CO2. Activated. Ballistic script has ended. TVC power is disabled. Plus 160 seconds. Plus 170 seconds. High speed data operator stop recording. High speed recording is complete. Low speed data operators stop recording. Low speed data recording complete. T plus three minutes, 30 seconds. Post fire crew, report to the instrument room. Post fire crew, report to the instrument room. Welcome back, and wow, what an amazing sight to see. This powerful solid rocket booster fired up. Again, we're here at the Northrop Grumman facility in Promontory, Utah, where we just witnessed a two minute booster firing of a solid rocket booster for the SLS rocket. Here with me to talk about that test and to, dis to answer your questions, we have Julia Kotobande, motor team lead for SLS boosters at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. And we have Jessica Rose, chemical engineer for Northrop Grumman, for the SLS boosters as well. So uh, before we begin, I just wanted to say, you know, we heard the test conductor talking a little bit before the uh, the firing. Can you explain a little bit more about what they were saying? So I'll start with Julia. Yeah, thanks, Alyssa. Wow, that was fantastic. So yeah, we heard the test conductor before the firing of the motor. Uh, she gave the go for test. Um, the test counted down and they committed the motor. They armed the motor, and then at T0, we saw smoke and fire. Um, we have out there today um, five segments of solid rocket motor. Um, at the T0 mark, a signal was given from a ground controller to an igniter assembly, which in turn ignited the five segments. At the other end of the motor, we have a nozzle assembly which had a nozzle plug and that would have come out as pressure built up inside the motor. We also have an aft skirt assembly and it houses our advanced booster electronic thrust vector control system and that vectored the nozzle during the test. A little bit later you heard the test conductor call for uh, the water deluge which actually sprays water on the belly of the motor in order to cool the case and we do that because we want to preserve and protect our hardware. And then a little bit later we had uh, the, the forward CO2 cooling and an aft boom swing around and uh, send CO2 cooling into the aft end of the motor. So yeah, the motor burned for 126 seconds, which is how long it will power the Artemis rockets during liftoff and early flight. And it was a great test. <laughs> well, thank you for that great detail, Julia. So Jessica, how did you feel? And can you tell us a little bit more about how we got to this moment? Yes, absolutely. So um, first of all, absolutely amazing. That um, is so bright. I was wondering if I'd be able to see after it. And I've seen many of these and it's just so impressive every single time and that's what every all these employees out here that work at Northrop Grumman and NASA that are here that work on the Artemis segment are so thrilled for to see that what we do daily impacts that success that you saw and Alyssa to answer your second question 
Uh, here in Utah, we manufacture these boosters from the beginning to the end of them. We start with case prep. During case prep, they prep the case and then they'll line, insulate the case and then line it. Once the case is lined, it'll then go down to the casting pits where they invert this horizontal segment into a vertical position, lower it down into this deep pit that fully covers the motor. And then after that, they start prepping it for what they call as a cast camp paint. During the cast camp, they will lower the propellant into the motor at a continuous rate. And then once the motor is full with propellant, it'll cure for about one week. After that week, they'll condition and send it on down to x-ray. During x-ray, they will see if there are any voids in the propellant. If not, they will go down to the final assembly building where they finalize these motors. They will put a igniter in the forward segment and a nozzle into the aft segment. They will then either send them here to the test area for a static test or put them into a conditioned storage building for when Kennedy Space Center requests our Artemis segments down to them. So it's quite pride filled that we get to take from the beginning to the end of these boosters. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of work from both NASA and Northrop Grumman has gone into this two minute booster firing. That's awesome. So now we're gonna get into some viewer questions. It looks like our first question is for Julia, asking how big are the SLS boosters? Okay, so the SLS boosters are 177 feet tall. So that's gonna be equivalent of a 17 story building. It's also as tall as the Statue of Liberty is from her base to her torch. Now the motor that we had out here today in our test stand wasn't quite that tall. It was 154 feet. And the reason is, is because we don't have the forward assembly that we have on our flight boosters in the test stand. The forward assembly consists of a nose cone and a frustrum and a forward skirt that houses our flight avionics. However, in a static test, we actually use avionics that are part of the test stand. Great. I mean, that, that was impressive to see. And, you know, you don't realize how big these boosters are until you're actually standing there in front of them. You know, I actually got the opportunity to see the Artemis 1 rollout and seeing how big about for Jessica. Why do we test in Utah? Okay, perfect. So like I talked about, uh, we do manufacture these here. And they're about, on average, 300,000 pounds each. And we have a test stand that can withstand these. Uh, the test stand has 13 million pounds of concrete in it, most of that underground. And so from that, there's 3.6 million pounds of thrust that comes from the 1.6 million pounds of propellant. The propellant that we manufacture here consists of aluminum powder, ammonium perchlorate, a binder, and a curing agent, which then when cured is about like an eraser. So that, that's a strange consistency, I must say. <laughs> It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to ask uh, Julia here another question. Can you tell us a bit more about the Artemis missions? Maybe give us an update? Sure. So we have um, a, an Artemis, an SLS program, which has um, a number of Artemis missions planned. The um, boosters that were actually um, Artemis mission, and we're using the remaining uh, shuttle hardware until it is expended. Uh, after that, at about the ninth flight, um, we're going to be bringing shuttle hardware, but it's also an opportunity for us to add even more uh, capacity to the motors. Um, so in our Artemis missions, we're going to be returning to the moon. We're going to be sending the first woman to the moon. And um, once we have an establishment on the moon, we'll be able to go into deep space and on to Mars. And so we're very excited in order to be a part of that. Yeah, it's a great opportunity that we live and work in the generation that is sending humanity back to the moon. That's really awesome. Um, I'm going to ask Jessica another question here. Um, last question, why do we, or how hot does it get at the test stand over there? How hot does that motor get? That's an excellent question. It is extremely hot, we'll just say that. So at the exit cone, there's 3,700 3, degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to burn the sand there into glass. And the side of the chamber is 5,600 degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to boil steel. So to answer your question, it gets very hot. <laughs> All right. I do want to ask just one more question, okay? okay? This is just, I need to know, how did your career as an aerospace begin? And I'm going to start with Julia. Okay. Yeah, mine starts way back. So uh, my parents were actually on their honeymoon and took a break to watch Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. Um, that was in, uh, oh, well, a long time ago. We won't go into how long ago. <laughs> but that was in the early 70s, we'll just say. And um, it's always been a part of the story of our family's beginning. So when I was a child, I was fascinated with space. Of course, I was deeply impacted by the Challenger. Um, so by the time I was in middle school, I knew I wanted to work for NASA. Uh, I went to college and got a 
degree in engineering and after that got a job in industry for a few years um, before taking a job at NASA. So I've been with NASA now for 22 years and for the last 14 of those I've actually been working on solid rocket boosters. And um, with Artemis 1 getting ready for launch, um, about to roll out to the pad, um, and then the testing that we're doing today which is going to support Artemis 3 missions and beyond, we are in a very exciting time and it's a great time to be uh, working on the SLS program. Well, that's a great story, Julia. Thank you. And Jessica, how about you? Yeah, great question. And I loved hearing Julia's story. We've actually had the great opportunity to work with each other on these missions and um, building this FSB2 booster. So I started out uh, growing up in a farm, farming town in Idaho, which you wouldn't really think uh, I would want to get into space, but I had such a passion for it. I just never knew I would be able to. So later on, I started realizing I had a great love for chemistry and math. So I went on to get a bachelor's of science in chemical engineering, chemistry, and the minor in material science engineering from the University of Idaho. From there, I tried a couple different industry paths, and then an opening came up at Northrop Grumman, which I found was very close by here in Utah, and I jumped in as a propellant engineer, and since then I've further, furthered my career. And what I, what I absolutely love is my, my daughter, she's a three-year-old, she's here in the viewing area, and she has that passion for space, and I get to share that with her. We do science experiments almost every single weekend, and like Julia mentioned, we, you know, we get to have the greatest impact and be a part of sending the first woman on the moon. And so I have a beautiful passion in my career and I'd love to share that with anybody. Well, thank you, that's a beautiful story. And uh, what a special moment that you and your daughter get to share in that you're gonna see the first woman on the moon in your lifetime, that's amazing. Well, thank you for sending in those questions. Thank you to Julia and Jessica for joining me here today. And if you would like to watch a replay of this test, it is available on our SLS Facebook page and NASA Marshall's YouTube channel. And it, until then, we'll see you at the first Artemis mission to the moon. See you at launch. CO2 falling. Um, the free air temperatures, though, still seem to suggest that there's nothing inside the skirt. Um, but I do still have some very warm nozzle components back there. So. Um, your call on the fire department. Let's go ahead and send the fire department up to uh, Dallas City Fire up there. All right.